Good morning, church. Open your Bibles to John chapter 19. Before I get started, I just want to say we have, we have made it. We have made it. And what I mean by that is we have made it really to the, the greatest event that has ever occurred in the history of the world. We've made it to the, the crucifixion of our, our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. And this is a, one of the most conflicting events in, in history, an event that for us who have put our faith and our, our trust in the Lord, who love the Lord, the, the crucifixion is, is really everything to us. Here at Redeem South Bay, it is the message that we proclaim each week as we take communion together. It's the message that we proclaim in the, in the preaching of our words. It's in the, it's in the songs that, that we sing. This event is the most important event that any person needs to know about. We know that in, in this event, there's a uh, an understanding that there is a divine purpose in the, in the death of Christ. And we will see that in verse 24 where it says, this was to fulfill the scripture. We know that Christ died a, a substitutionary death for those who believe in him. And he took our punishment, our judgment, the, the full penalty of our, our sins. And he did so voluntarily under the sovereign purpose of God so that now we can be forgiven and and that he would be glorified. And if you just look at the, the title of my sermon, the, the crucifixion of the king for his glory. For his glory, but also for our, for our good. So we're going to be looking at the crucifixion of our king, but not just any king. We are going to see today that it goes even further than that, that, that the, creative, the creator of the world is is going to be killed by his creatures. The very people that he created are going to kill him, and we need to remember, and, and I said this a couple weeks ago, and I think this is important, we need to remember that he did this for us. I mean, that is, that is what makes this so amazing and so beautiful, is that he did it for us. And we've been seeing that really since the, the very beginning. In fact, back in chapter 1, I just want to read this, chapter 1, verse 10 through 12, it says, He, meaning Jesus, was in the world. He, he took on human flesh, and the world was made through Him. He is the Creator. Yet the world did not know Him. He came to His own, and His own people did not receive Him. They, they rejected Him, and they crucified Him. But to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That's what we've been looking forward to. This, this, this verse in the first chapter tells us what we're going to be looking forward to to this very day. And we're going to see that Jesus endured the cross to pay the penalty for our sins. It is a true story. It's, it's the most important day in history. But I, I want us to, to have this in mind, that it is for our good. And so we, we personalize this, that he did it for us. So let's go ahead and read our text for this morning. I'm going to begin at what we finished last week at the beginning of verse 16. John chapter 19, verse 16 through 27. This is the word of God. So he, meaning Pilate, delivered him over to them to be crucified. So they took Jesus, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, and Jesus between them. Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. 
So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic. But the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, Let us not tear it, but cast lots for it, to see whose it shall be. This was to fill the scripture which says, They divided my garments among them, and they cast my cl- and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things, but standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciples took her, the the disciple took her to his own home. Let's pray. Father, we come before you this morning and we we have in some ways been longing to to come to this place in the book of John to to glory in what Christ has done. Lord, we I just pray that as we go through these verses, Lord, that you would be glorified and that we as who are believers in the Lord Jesus Christ would just have a greater love for you and what you have done in sending your son. Lord, we thank you again for your grace to us. In his name we pray. Amen. You know, it's fascinating to me since we begin, began preaching through this gospel that we've, as I said, kind of been longing for the scene. And I had this vision kind of like, um, what is this like? And, and I remember as a young child, we were, I was around when the first rockets were sent to the moon. Many of you were not around at that time, but I was. And I can remember, you know, this, this event, and it, it, they, they shoot off these, these huge Saturn V rockets, and these rockets are, are going, and they're going, and they're, it's days and days and days until it finally gets there. And that's like this. We, we, we've been set off on this journey, and, and we were fin- finally there, but there's something that I no- you notice in this passage that we get to this place and, and John does not give us much. It's like getting to the moon and saying, they landed, that's it. <laughs> Simply what John says in verse 18 is this, there they crucified him. Yes, he says that there was one on one side and one on the other, but there they crucified him. The question is, is that enough? In some ways, yes, it's enough. In the context of the people who would be reading John's gospel, it would have, they would have had a great understanding of what crucifixion was and don't. And so, you know, we, we want to lay some of those things out, but is it enough? There, they crucified him. Now, just these few words, and yes, we're told how he got to that place. We're, we're told that he was crucified. We, we're told that these things were displayed on the cross. We know that they were casting lots for his clothing, and, and we, we see that, that Jesus has a concern for his mother. And in this passage, I, I have five points that we're going to look at. And, and I think in these five points, there's, there's more than enough. There's more than enough for us to be drawn more and more in love with Jesus. Now, it, it seems incredibly brief, but, but what we need to remember is that when these words were written, they were short and they, they may seem in some way insignificant, but they, to the original readers, as I said, they, they had so much meaning. So let's look at this first point. The cross of the king carried... But before we get there, I, I, I want to just go back to last week and the first part of verse 16 that Kenny covered. And it says, in verse 16, 
says, so he, meaning Pilate, delivered him, Jesus, over to them, the Romans, to be crucified. So Pilate, who is this human authority, hands Jesus over to them to be crucified. And everyone would have known what that meant. We saw last week as Kenny described the beating that our Lord and Savior went through. That they took this whip and it possibly had pieces of metal or pieces of bone in the ends of this whip. And and he would have been whipped. And they placed this crown of thorns on his head and they would have taken him and, and stripped him of all of his clothes. And so they had beaten Jesus. And the thing about Jesus is, as I said, he, he did this for us. He received this beating for us. And his skin would have been torn off his back. And he, he would have been bleeding profusely. And after this beating was completed... We are told in the second half of verse 16, so they, the soldiers, took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of a skull, which in Aramaic is called Golgotha. Now, Jesus has been beaten and at this point he's he's probably incredibly weak and he was tasked with, with carrying his own cross as all prisoners were probably tasked. This wasn't something that was unusual. But the question is, what would most people have done if they knew that they were going to be crucified? They would have fought. They would have struggled. They would have cried out. They would have protested. Historians tell us that on some occasions they would have to tie them up and and drag them to the cross. But in verse 16 again, it says, so, so they took Jesus and he went out bearing his own cross. I mean, this is remarkable that he has a willingness and a joy set before him to go and to endure the cross Remember back in John chapter 10, verse 18, he says this. He says, no one takes my life from me, but I lay it down on my own accord. Nobody takes it from me. This is what was said of the the suffering servant back in Isaiah chapter 53, that he was was like a lamb that, that is led to the slaughter, that he did not open his mouth, that he did not protest. We know that he was the Lamb of God who, who takes away the, the sins of the world. And, and therefore, as the Lamb of God, he's, he's willing to go and, and to do this. And he, he's doing it for us. And when, when we think of this cross, we, the, the cross was actually in two pieces. There was one piece that was left at the, the crucifixion site. And it was in the ground. And, and it would stay there. But they would, they, they would take the cross member and they would bring it back to the prisoner. And the, the prisoner would would have to bear that cross. And, and, and it said that the cross was anywhere from 100 to, to 200 pounds. But do you know what the greatest weight that was on that cross it was the weight of our sin. It was the weight of our sin. Colossians, Paul says this in Colossians chapter 2, verse 14. He took the record of debt that stood against us. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And so Jesus bears that cross. He takes that that cross upon his back and he and he walks and he walks on a road that's called the the, what has been called the Via Della Rosa. We know that those other criminals are probably with him. We know that Jesus is so weak that the other gospel writers tell us that in his humanity, he was so weak that that Simon of Cyrene had to to help him carry the cross. But Jesus presses on and he, he takes his cross. And, you know, I want to remind us again that he endured the cross to bear the penalty of our sins. And John 
shows Jesus' willingness to bear that cross as he, as he goes voluntarily to that place where he's going to die. Hebrews 12 says this, for, for, for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, scorning its shame. It says earlier when he was coming into to Jerusalem, or, when he was coming into Jerusalem, that he set his, his, his heart to go to Jerusalem, knowing that he was going to, to die. This brings us to our, our second point, the, the crucifixion of our king proclaimed. We see this in, in verse 18. And again, we're told of his crucifixion ever so, so briefly. John writes, there they crucified him. There they, they crucified him. And and when you think of crucifixion, it, it brings about so many pictures. And, you know, crucifixions were, were around at that time. They, they were happening. And, I mean, if we just think about it, that Jesus Christ is crucified, but there's two others with him. This wasn't a special event, except that it was the Passover, and, and Jesus Christ was the Passover lamb. And it was a common common practice, and they would, sometimes they would tie them to the cross, sometimes they would nail them to the cross. They would literally put the criminals on display, and it was, it was designed to be a deterrent so that people would not go against Rome. It was designed to be excruciating. It was designed to be humiliating so that no one would want the fate of of those who were crucified. And it, we're told that, that many saw Jesus hanging on the cross. Psalm 22, verse 6 through 8, talking about the, the crucifixion of, of Christ a thousand years before, says this, but I'm a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. As Christ is hanging on that cross, people are mocking and, and, and scorning him, wagging their heads, and he's on display for all to see. And that was the, the point of, of crucifixion. John doesn't get into the details because he the people know what crucifixion means. We have, we have nothing like this. And in fact, capital punishment is being done away with more and more. But we have nothing like this. This is what mo was the most excruciating form of capital punishment, really, that man has ever created. And so when they arrive at this place called Golgotha, the place of the skull, that when they arrived there, Jesus would have been laid on his back or thrown on his back, and they would have nailed him to this cross member, and then they would have pulled this cross member, and they would have attached it to that, that other beam, and then they would have nailed his, his feet to the cross. And you may ask, you know, you know I, why do we have to get into the details? And, and I know for some of us, we... We've seen the passion of our Lord, the passion of Christ, and it's hard to watch. To be honest with you, I've only watched it maybe once or twice because it is hard to watch. But when we watch that and we see that and we see it happening, again, I want to remind us that He did that for us. This is what He... In endured for, for you and for me. And speaking of the suffering servant, Isaiah 53 says he was, he was numbered with the transgressors. And we see that in verse 18 where it says, there they crucified him with, with two others, one on either side and Jesus between, between them. But even more than that, when, he, when it says that he was numbered with the transgressors, he was numbered with us. You know, we want to look at these criminals that were crucified Jesus didn't deserve it. Jesus didn't deserve the punishment, but, but we deserved the punishment. So he would have been lifted up onto this cross, and again, this beam would have been 
fastened to this other beam. And as I said, they, they, they would have nailed his feet to the cross. And that, that nailing of the feet would allow the one who was crucified to be able to push up just enough to get, to get a breath. And in every breath that, that Jesus takes, we're reminded of the pain and suffering that he is going through. And when Jesus is on the cross, there, there are seven things that, that he utters on the cross, and each one of them is, is so brief because it's so hard for him even to breathe. It's almost impossible. As I said, it was excruciating. And our word, excruciating, we, we know that it means this is in, incredibly and extremely painful. But that word excruciating, is, it comes from Latin, which means from the cross. From the cross. And so when, when we think of that word excruciating, we think of, of what Jesus Christ endured. And we know that he endured, and he, he endured to pay the penalty of our sins. And as I said, he had to carry our sins. And if you could just look at your sins and you could just list them out, whatever it might be, lust, adultery, murder, gossip, slander, pride, those things would have been nailed to the cross. And we see that the crime that Jesus was accused of was also nailed to that cross. Verse 19. This is where we see the crime of the king displayed in verse 19. It says, Pilate also wrote an inscription and put it on the cross, and it read, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, and in Greek. So the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, Do not write the king of the Jews, but rather this man said, I am the king of the Jews. And Pilate answered, What I have written, I have written. Now, Pilate has this sign made to place it on the cross, and this was a common occurrence that, that the offenses would be nailed there. But it's ironic because what he writes, what Pilate actually writes, declares the innocence of the king. And so when you look at, at that point in, in your notes where it says the crime of the king displayed, you could, you could riddle, literally put parentheses around it and say, this is what he's accused of, but, but there's no crime there. Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews, that's a true statement. He, it wasn't a crime, but it's what he was a, a, accused of. And when we go back to chapter 18, verse 38, what does Pilate say? He says, I find no guilt in him. I find no guilt in him. In, in chapter 19, verse 6, it says, he says, I find no guilt in him. And then we must ask, why? Why is, was he, is he being crucified if there's no guilt in him? Well, we, we know one, and we're going to see that in our next point, that it was under the sovereign purpose of God. But in the human, at the human level, you know, we know that Pilate sought to release him. We see that back in, in verse 12. It says, Pilate sought to release him, but the Jews cried out, if you release this man, you are not Caesar's friend. Everyone who makes him a king opposes Caesar. Pilate is giving in to their, basically their, their blackmail. If you don't do this, if you don't crucify this man, we're going to tell and you're going to get in trouble. And so Pilate gives in to them, and Pilate writes, Jesus of Nazareth, the king of the Jews. And the Jews immediately object, because what Pilate says is so offensive to them. How could this man who is at this moment hung on a cross in, in humiliation be our king? You know, they're saying, this is, this is not our king. And they've just said that we have no king but, but Caesar. No, kill this man because he claims to be our king. Don't write that he is the king of the Jews. Write that he said he was the king of the Jews. 
or that he, that he thinks he is the king of the Jews. But don't write what is actually true. You know, the last thing is that they want is this man who is suffering this horrible death to be labeled their king. And the whole reason they wanted him dead was because he was not only declaring himself to be king, but he was declaring himself to be the son of God. But he was the king of the Jews. And, and they were just acting in their, in their complete ignorance of who Jesus truly was. Listen to what Paul says in, in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 7 and 8. He says this, But we impart a secret and hidden wisdom and I'm sorry, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God, which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. They're oblivious to what they're doing. They're so oblivious to what they, they're doing that, that they go about crucifying the King of glory. No, he was being crucified because he was the Messiah, the Son of God, and he, he was sent to atone for the sins of his people because he was, is the King of the Jews. But he's not just the King of the Jews, but he's the King of kings and the, and the Lord of lords. In verse 20, says, Many of the Jews read this inscription for the place where, where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Aramaic, in Latin, Greek. That means that, Jesus, or that Pilate had this written three times. Once in, in Aramaic or, or, or Hebrew, which was the language of the Jewish, Jewish people. Latin was the, the, the language of the, the Roman leaders and the soldiers. And Greek was the, the language of the common people of the Roman Empire. And, you know, those were the, the languages that Pilate chose so that everybody could read. You know, we know it was the Passover, and as many pilgrims were there, they would have read this. And what, what Pilate writes is actually the, the truth, that he is the anointed one, that he is the Messiah. Back in chapter 18, Pilate asked Jesus this question, so you are a king? And Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this purpose I was born, and for this purpose I have come into the world. Back in John chapter 12, when he was coming into the city, they, they shouted, Blessed is the king of Israel. He had already been declared their king, and this, so this is a, a, a true statement, but they're rejecting him as king. And, and as he is stripped of his clothes, and as he's hanging there on his cross, his clothes are laid there on the ground, and these soldiers take these clothes, and which brings us to our, our, our very next point, the clothes of the king divided. And these soldiers, they, they're oblivious to what's going on, that, that Jesus Christ is hung on the cross. And they're, they're looking at his clothes. And you think of how callous that could be. You see in verse 23 and 24, it says, When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his garments and divided them into four parts, one part for each soldier, also his tunic, but the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from top to bottom. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. This was to fulfill the scripture which says, they divided my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. So the soldiers did these things. Here we see an explanation about his garments being divided. And, and we have to understand that this was something that was normal for the, the soldiers to do. It was almost like a bonus. Look, if, if you go out and crucify people, you get what they have. As I said, they're, it's a tragic scene that these men are, are, are gambling for Jesus' clothing. What John does is he takes his focus, he takes his focus off of Jesus on the cross, and he, and he places it on these soldiers who are, who are casting lots, and, and lots were, were 
kind of like dice, and they're casting lots for this, this tunic, which a tunic would have been a, a long piece, and in, in, some of the commentators say this was, this was probably valuable because it was sewn in one piece. It was one full piece of fabric, and these soldiers see this tunic, and rather than tearing it, it would have probably been hard to tear. Rather than ripping it into pieces and dividing it, they see this tunic, one, I think not to tear it, but also because it would lose its value. And so what they decided to do in verse 24 is, this, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see whose it shall be. And they do this, and the thing that we see in this is that, you know, this is, this is Jesus on, on the cross, and this is his atoning work of salvation, and Jesus is dying for the sins of the world, and, and John focuses on these, these four soldiers and what they're doing. And he's doing it because he is showing that this is under the sovereign purpose of God. That this is what God had, had declared that this would take place. And the gospel writers include so much more detail about what is happening on the cross. But John looks at these soldiers and he talks about the garments. And he says in verse 24 that this was to fulfill the scripture. And this is happening, this is written some about a thousand years before this is taking place. And in Psalm 22, it's not just a psalm about casting lots, but it, it's a psalm about the crucifixion. And it's showing us what is going on, what is taking place on the cross is part of God's redemptive work. Just listen to Psalm 22, verse 16 through 18. He says this, For, for dogs encompass me. Is that what's going on here? Absolutely. A, a company of, of evildoers encircle me. They have pierced my hands and feet. As he's hung on the cross, I can count all my bones. They stare and, and gloat over me. But lastly, they, they divide my garments among them, and, and for my clothing they cast lots. Now, John includes this because the Holy Spirit has inspired the writer David to declare what is going to take place. Well, it's a horrible scene, and we see in it the glory of Christ because it is Christ fulfilling the fulfilling of Scripture, one after another, down to the most intimate detail. God is unfolding His purpose in Christ for His glory and for our good. And so, you have this being fulfilled in the sovereign purpose of God, and you have these four soldiers, and they're there, and they're dividing, dividing his clothing. But, but John next turns his attention to these four women, and, and I believe this is a contrast because you have these four soldiers, and now you have these four women, these four soldiers who are not looking at Christ. They're looking at what they can get from him, yet you have these four women these four women there, and this brings us to our last point, the concern of the king declared. And you see these four women, and it says in verse 25, so the soldiers did these things. But standing by the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing nearby, he said to his mother, woman, Behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her to his own home. Again, if you were telling the story of Jesus' death and, and his sacrifice for our sins, this, this story seems pretty insignificant, doesn't it? It's kind of like, why, why did John include this here. And I think it's, it's there for, for a, a couple of reasons. And John tells us, he changes his focus from these, these four, from these four soldiers to these four women. He looks at, at Mary, Jesus' mother, and he looks at, at Jesus' aunt. He looks at this, another Mary, Mary the wife of Clopas, and then he looks at the final Mary, Ma Mary Magdalene, and, and they're standing, and they, they have their eyes fixed on Jesus. And Jesus looks at them, and, 
And he also looks at this one that is described this way, that the disciple whom Jesus loved. And we know that that disciple is none other than the author of this gospel, the writer, John the disciple. Because John doesn't declare his name, he uses this, the disciple whom Jesus loved. And, and so you have these women and, and John there, and he's, he's there, and he's, he's with Jesus' mother. And he says to Mary, woman, behold your son. And then he says to John, behold your mother. And it's interesting because John is, is not the son of Mary. It's, it's not his, his biological mother. And I think it, it, this story reveals Jesus' real obedience to the Father, even up to the point of death. We know in the law it says, what? Honor your father and mother. And Jesus was the firstborn son. It was his responsibility. It was his responsibility to, to make sure that his mother was cared for. And even on his cross, he's there and he, he has a concern for his mother. And we know that Jesus has other brothers and sisters, but, but they're not there. And, and they're at this point not believing. But John is there. We talked about this we, as we usually do. We, we go through the passage a couple weeks before, before we preach, and we talked about this, that, that, that Pastor Kevin um, had a relationship with a, a friend of his, Scott Kesselring, and, and that Scott Kesselring uh, had become a believer, and he has these children. And, and being a new believer and, and, and wanting his, kill, his children to be cared for in a, in a way, if, if anything were to happen to he and his wife Angie, they wanted Kevin to know that, Kevin, we want you to take care of our children if something were to happen to us. I think this is a similar thing going on here, that, that Jesus wants somebody to, to care for his mother if anything were to happen to him, and we know something is happening to him, don't we? And so he, he hands basically... Mary, his mother, over to John to, to have John care for her. We know that her other children aren't followers at, at this point, and we know that, that James and, and Jude are probably Jesus' half-brothers, and it was, it, was, it was Jesus' responsibility to do this. And he, so he hands Mary over to, to John and we, we also see John's concern to honor Jesus because it says, and from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. This gospel was written some 50 years after this event. Some 50 years, John is writing this saying, from that hour I took her into my own home. He probably cared for her until his until her death. Even though other family members had become believers, John did what Jesus said. He cared. He cared for Jesus and he cared for Mary. And so we see Jesus being obedient to the Father, but we also see that John is, is being obedient to Jesus. And, and that is our call, isn't it? Aren't you grateful that Jesus was obedient to the Father? That he bore his cross? That he was crucified? He did this for you and for me? And he was living this life, a perfect life. And when he got on that cross, he didn't, he didn't stop living that perfect life. He could have just said, oh, it's done. He will say, and we'll see this soon, it is finished. But before it is finished, he continues to do what his heavenly father would have wanted him to do. And he does it unto death. And it's done for us. And he, he bore his cross. He suffered this crucifixion. He suffered this humiliation. And he continued to care and he continued to care for us. And let's finish with this, Philippians chapter 2, verse 5 through 8. 
The Apostle Paul writes, Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant and being born in the likeness of men and being found in human form, he humbled himself by, be, be, by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Amen? Let's pray. Father, we, we come before you and we, we thank you. We thank you for your son and his willingness to suffer the, the ultimate injustice, but to do so for us. Those who have put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And my prayer is for anybody here who has not yet done this, who has not cried out to you that they would today. They would look at Jesus and see what he has done for them, that he might give them life and that they might have it to the full. Lord, we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.